Uh, just a little background for those who are joining for the first time. Uh, Music Cosmos is an initiative uh, by Be My Ears, which is a platform where singers, songwriters, composers, they can discover the commercial potential of their music through a crowdsourced feedback tool. Um, and basically, uh, Music Cosmos was born from this need for a community where artists, uh, industry professionals and brands can come together, network, uh, showcase their work and learn from one another. So um, um, basically the essence of these communities that we need more of this, right? And less of that. Uh, uh, and that's why we're here today. And even though we're gathering online, uh, just remember that these, uh, the goal is that we're, you know, like we're a big community and you guys are more than welcome to ask uh, questions. Um, I always bring these numbers to our panels. I think it's, uh, it's pretty incredible to, you know, look at the, the audience that we have. And, and, and today uh, we literally have people from all corners of the world. Uh, so just you, so you guys can see 63% of us today in this room uh, or watching these later are composers or songwriters. 7% of us are uh, producers or musicians, guitarists, bassists, keyboard players, and things like that. And 17% of us are uh, industry members, meaning people who work in labels or managing artists and things like that. And we have people from Albania, Argentina, Belgium, Brazil, Canada, Colombia, Denmark, Ecuador, France, Germany, Greece, Hong Kong, India, Ireland, Israel, Italy, Lebanon, Madagascar, Malaysia, Mexico, the Netherlands, Norway, Peru, Portugal, Russia, Scotland, Slovakia, South Africa, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, the UK, the US, and Vietnam. I think it's badass that we can gather people from all these places. Um, in an online gathering like this. So thank you guys for joining. Uh, also, thank you so much, um, you know, our partners, Speedfire Audio, uh, Lursen Mastering, Zen Mohawk Records and Mara Music from Brazil. Um, a little, um, just a friendly uh, reminder in case you guys haven't downloaded yet, uh, because you're here today, because you're joining these panels, you have instant access to Spitfire's BBC Symphony Orchestra Discover package. It's a, a virtual instrument package. It's pretty badass. So if you are a composer or songwriter, if you want to explore different ways to compose and write music, uh, go ahead and download it. Uh, the video now shows a little bit of how, you know, the process of how to get this, uh, this package. There's a promo code I'll also share on the chat. And now you're hearing uh, just a sample of one of their uh, instruments. So it's pretty cool. Go ahead and download it. Uh, lastly, we just announced uh, a couple of days ago our first composer competition, also in partnership with Speedfire Audio and Lursen Mastering and Skunkworks Audio. Uh, entries close on February 21st. Uh, just go ahead and check uh, uh, the page for all the details, how to join. It's free to join. And we have also some amazing prizes from these companies, from these partners uh, for you guys who are joining and competing. Uh, and without further ado, there are a few more announcements, but I'll do it as we, um, as we move forward. Uh, so let's start our conversation. Thank you guys again for being here. I really, really appreciate it again. Uh, I wanted to start by asking you guys to introduce yourselves and, and, and talk and, you know, tell a little bit about the work that you do, uh, your inspirations. Um, let's just start with you or Anne. <laughs> uh, sure. Um, yeah, I'm a Los Angeles based composer. I uh, came to Los Angeles, I think, eight years ago, and um, first came here to study, and then I um, ended up assisting. Uh, I worked for Cine Samples for a while, um, and for Hollywood scoring on video games, and then I ended up, um, you know, writing additional music and just collaborating with people like Christopher Leonards and Alan Menken and. Uh, you know, I did some tech work for Steve Jablonski and uh, interned for Hans Zimmer, you know, the whole 
the whole thing um, just working for other composers. And then eventually I started to get enough work of my own. Um, and also through, you know, the connections, um, composers were helping me out, especially Klaus Badelt. Um, and yeah, we've been collaborating for many years and I've basically been able to um, build up my own brand, my own studio, um, thanks to that. And so, yeah, I've um, recently scored a bunch of Netflix productions um, and uh, yeah, that that's pretty much me. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> you recently, there, there was a, a recent production on Netflix, right? That you composed for, it was, was it yes. Fearless, the latest one? Um, there were three. Uh, Fearless is the one, an animated movie, uh, mm -hmm. a Netflix movie that came out in August internationally. Then I did one, uh, it's called The Klaus Family or De Familie Klaus, uh, as it's currently called, uh, which was a uh, Dutch Belgian production and so far it's only been released in the Dutch and Belgian Netflix and in France I think um, but it's going to be released internationally on Netflix this year and then I also helped out on a production called If Anything Happens I Love You which is a short film about gun violence and apparently it, it also blew up on Netflix um, which has never happened for a short film um, but this one was particularly special because it dealt with, you know, gun violence and the aftermath of, you know, grief of losing your child and such. I was pretty brave of Netflix to, um, to publish that. But yeah, so that's, um, those are the three that just came out. Nice. That's awesome. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Um, let's go in order here. Mitchell. Hello. Hey, yeah, so I'm a, uh, I'm also an LA based composer right now. Um, I've been here for just over two years. Um, I'm finishing my degree at Los Angeles College of Music and uh, Composition. Um, I, I'm a senior, I graduated here in a couple months actually. Um, and currently I uh, work for several different production companies. I compose mainly for commercials and TV, um, mainly catalog music that gets needle dropped into shows and whatnot and uh, that's where i'm at right now uh, excited to graduate awesome thank you man thanks for sharing of course toby hi folks uh yeah my name is toby i uh i guess i sort of come here in two different capacities um i'm i'm an artist a music artist and composer also um, but also work for Spitfire Audio. I uh, look after all of our events and brand partnerships. Um, and it was, yeah, probably the music route that got me to Spitfire, um, having to put out records and making music videos and DJing and kind of just, yeah, based in London, kind of been here for just over 10 years doing that stuff. And through that world, uh, got introduced to uh, people that ended up working around me um, in different capacities as, as our kind of careers progressed. And my manager, as, a, as an electronic musician, um, ended up working for this small startup called Spitfire. Um, and he, he kind of then uh, introduced me to that world a little bit later on. And his role for me changed. He stopped being my manager and he's actually now the CEO of Spitfire. Um, so yeah, I kind of balanced my time between, um, before the pandemic, there was lots of traveling, uh, we were popping up kind of everywhere doing events and, um, sometimes hosting masterclasses or, uh, attending festivals, film festivals, music, film festivals, um, or putting on just our own sort of bespoke events. Um, and in, in, in the rest of my time I'm working on um, at the moment, a, I have been working on, a, on an EP um, which uses sunlight to trigger MIDI. It's kind of a custom build instrument that uh, I've worked on with some engineers from Spitfire over the last couple of years. And uh, yeah, that's basically me. That's awesome. Thanks for being here today. Um, I think it's 
really incredible that that you you know I, I i remember reading one of the questions that people uh sent through the rsvp forms one of them asking you know what is it that you do while you're not composing you know do you teach or whatever you know and all the stuff that you just mentioned uh we're gonna get into it but i just wanted to you know highlight that i think it's really cool uh to you know you're a composer you're composing but there's also these other facets of music that we are all right involved with uh and i think it's cool that you brought that up already we're gonna get more deep into that thank you toby uh emir how are you my friend good how are you good good thanks for having me and all of us and uh so I'm Emir, I'm originally from Turkey, uh, and I've been in the States for 23 years. I went to Berkeley College of Music originally in 98, 2002, and then graduated and came to LA in 2002. So I've been in LA for about 19 years now. And um, I'm a film composer primarily. I'm also a, a piano player as well, jazz piano player. Uh, but I, you know, I wish I could do both. Uh, you know, full time, but I picked the film music. Uh, just, just there's not that enough time to do both. But when there's a chance, I you know play some gigs. Well, obviously pre-COVID, <laughs> um, you know, in town, and it's always fun. But uh, I uh, when I moved here, I had the privilege to work with uh, Philip Giffen. Uh, I was his assistant for a while. He was a, he's uh, uh, also a Berkeley grad and. We worked on some uh, major TV shows, and around that time, I also uh, was the assistant for Hey Torpera, who's uh, composer at Hans Zimmer's Remote Control Productions, and uh, I was there for three years as well. And then I started doing my own um, projects, and also uh, my best friend, also from Turkey as well, that I met her at the Nar Toprak. She, uh, we met at Berkeley. And uh, you guys might not actually, and you know, uh, you know, so pretty well too. And uh, I uh, sometimes uh, work for her, you know, on her productions, uh, projects as an arranger, additional music, depending on uh, what she needs. And, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, I try to, you know, when there's, uh, I, when there's no film music, uh, gigs, you know, I also work for music libraries as well, so I write some uh, tracks for them as well. That's pretty much it. Awesome, thank you. Thanks for sharing. Sure. Um, Greco. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks, Bruno, for, for having me. Um, well, I, uh, I'm originally from Brazil. I moved here in 1995 to go to a Musicians Institute. Uh, as a guitar player, graduated, I started working, and over the years, I've worked with a lot of people. I toured with um, Katie Lang and Shakira and Gwen Stefani, and I've recorded with, um, I've recorded stuff for a few composers, uh, Trevor Morris, Blake Neely, uh, James Newton Howard, um, yeah, and then I mainly, uh, until March last year, I mainly did touring and recording as a musician. And since we, uh, our side of the industry is pretty much um, paralyzed for the foreseeable future, I decided to uh, do something that I really wanted to do for a number of years, which is transition into more composing. So I started writing and um, studying orchestration with probably one of the um, Mitchell's teachers, Norman Ludwin. I know he teaches at, uh, at Lama. Yep. Yep. Um, so I did his uh, eight week course that the Musicians Union here in LA was offering and, and uh, got hooked on Spitfire products um, through the BBC uh, SO discovery thing. And I remember showing it to you, Bruno, right when I got it and we were both yeah. like, oh my God, this sounds amazing. Um, and also I've watched a bunch of videos from Christian and just been immersing myself and trying to get as much info and, and practice as I can. So this is it. That's it for me. That's cool. Yeah. I remember we were both like, how come we, you know, it's really, really cool. Um, 
again, thank you guys for for the introductions. And I think I don't know. Let's uh, there there are a few questions here, and uh, how about we start with this one? Uh, since we can all agree that you guys are all composers, right? Although some of you have other stuff happening, uh, what are the ways to get into the film industry? Who wants to go first? Uh, maybe let's go with Anne. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I would say there are probably about three ways. Um, one way that you see a lot is the composer assistant route, actually, that, you know, you assist someone and then um, after a couple of years of doing that, you know, they help you out, or at least you can leverage the contacts that you've made. Um, another way that you can turn a lot is you have a lot of Scandinavian and Icelandic electronic artists and musicians or concert composers that are kind of specifically hired for their sound. Um, so, you know, you also have previous examples like Philip Glass or, you know, Trent Reznor, Atticus Ross, you know, these guys that really made uh, a name for themselves in the, you know, independent artist world and then are hired for their artistry. Um, yeah, or you start out, you know, really in the indie world and you start to score, you know, student short films and you just kind of go from there, I suppose, and, you know, start with the ultra low budget indie films and kind of work your way out with, you know, different directors and editors and producers and just go from there, I would say. Um, one last way, I mean, I got a lot of I got a lot out of working for cine samples just because of their location. And of course you get all the, um, you know, software in the world and all this kind of stuff. So um, I certainly got a lot out of that. I don't know if that's the case with other uh, library companies as well. For me, it was just um, that they were located at Sonic Fuel Studios, which is just a compound full of composers. And so you know, after two years of being there, obviously we all knew each other and that's kind of how, you know, Chris Leonard's knew about me and stuff like that. So that definitely was helpful as well in terms of, um, you know, getting into the game. But I don't know if that's a super common way of going, to be honest. And there's, I mean, from what you mentioned too, there's also, you know, the networking part of it, right? Like, you know, yeah basically you're you're there you're surrounded by people who work in the field and eventually something pops up and yeah i mean um i feel like that's the most common story that you're just somewhere and you're the junior assistant or intern or something and you're just helping out with something and there's always going to be some emergency at some point and if you can be there and help out and kind of save the day um you know people start to trust you more and more and it's it's a very recommendation based industry so the moment um you know i had done as part of hollywood scoring i had done a mock-up for alan menken that's basically when christopher leonards took notice and was like, hey, you want to come do that for me as well. But that was probably after almost two years of being there. It's it's a very slow game, I think, this this entire job. It takes so much time to just be present, be in people's minds, gain their trust. And then eventually someone's going to go, you know, she's been here for two years. Maybe she doesn't suck. Let's, let's try her out. And then you kind of get an opportunity to prove yourself. Awesome. Anybody would like to add to that, Toby? Yeah, I'll just take the opportunity, if I may, just to, to come in and sort of, um, off the back of uh, what you guys have both just said, I think um, on, on the kind of networking thing, um, you know, it's, it's so helpful to, for you to approach people that you like um, and 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 art and art that you like, you know, if you're going to get in touch with the director or work on something that you want to work on, um, I mean, it's instead of just kind of carpet bombing your contacts or thinking about ways in which you could get a gig through somebody, which could just be any old thing. I think that the times I've had success in my life with these kinds of jobs is where you feel compelled to reach out to that person because you like what they do, you like their art, you like their direction. Um, and, you know, if, if sometimes you like it because there might be a kind of synergy with what you're doing, which is why it picks your ears up or your eyes up or 
and, and actually in those instances you can make a connection because it might be that the director actually hears your music and actually yeah you've you've tuned into something here that I am all about so this is great that you got in touch with me and that sometimes can be um it, it could just be it could be an email you know it, it, just something as simple as just getting in touch with somebody that you've you might you may ne never have met before I know that you guys are talking about having been brought up in an industry but you know for a lot of people I guess in here um, and some of the talks and panels that we've put on ourselves at Spitfire before is that there's not been that much exposure for people and sometimes it is a case of kind of cold calling and hitting emails and obviously you can send 90 emails and, and maybe you get five back but if you aim for stuff that you really like and that you feel is um, I don't know just resonating with you then when you do get the job you're going to really enjoy it as well and it's not just going to be something that you'd rather sort of pass on anyway. Awesome. Mitchell, were you going to say something? Yeah, uh, I was going to add on to, yeah, so like, like, and uh, what Ann said, so um, like, composer assistant is such a great route, um, right, right, like right now, I'm composer assistant for Steve Piccaro. Um, but also using, using, if you, like, if you're struggling to build up credits, um, like, especially early in the game, when you're first trying to like, get your foot in the door and trying to break in, um writing for catalogs can always be a good first option because what they'll get you sometimes is that they'll get you a few essential credits to kind of build up like they'll build up what you say what you, what you can say your music is used in because when, when you write for certain production companies um you're basically kind of piggybacking off of their connections with music supervisors and directors um to be able to get your music placed. So even if like, even just starting off for um, just trying to get your music placed in a few big um, opportunities like that, working with production companies, trying to find production companies that you would really want to work with is a really good first option, I think. Cool. Emir or Greco. <laughs> You don't have to, I mean. Uh, I mean, I, I second everything everybody said, and you know, the composer assistants throughout has definitely you know, worked for me too. And uh, I guess the origin actually, uh, at the fact that I you know, went to Berkeley College of Music, actually my first week, the, the Berkeley office and the alumni office in LA actually connected to, to the composer, Phil Giffen here. So that was a way that I got into it too, uh, but, uh, as Anne said, yeah, you know, there's, you know, you can always um, apply for independent films. Uh, there are some, you know, online sites for those things that you can just at least more, more you do, you know, more uh, eventually work you get. And lately, I have to say, you know, social media is definitely effective too, I think, because what happens is like if I post something about a project that I've done, Somehow, like in a couple of days, somebody writes to me and say, hey, by the way, you know, congratulations. I have another job, you know, like, would you like to do it? Like, so there's always a little effect there that I see. Um, and I think that's, and I'm not actually great at it yet. I, still, I need to be even better at it, but it's like, I, I see the potential of social media for sure. Yeah, and in fact, there is a one of, another question that we have here is about that. Like, what is the, the your favorite, you know, virtual networking tip. Uh, I guess that these, what we're doing here right now is something, right? We're here, we're all, you know, connected and, and exchanging ideas, exchanging like information and people who are there watching right now, they're here. There's also like a spreadsheet happening right now where people are like adding their contact information and networking that way. So I think it's really, really important. One thing that really caught like what Toby mentioned about like reaching out to projects that kind of like are related to what you, uh, uh, you know, it's just like when when we reached out to Spitfire asking if they would like to partner up with us for us to do this, uh, there is something right. There is a there is a theme. There is something that goes with the same vibe. Let's put it that way of the brand. And I think like with with work, it's pretty much the same thing, right? It's not like you're gonna start like shooting everywhere and see what happens. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a, a, I mean, just summing up 
summarizing everything. I think it's a great way to, uh, Greg, were you, were you going to mention something uh, and I cut you? No, I'm, I'm taking notes because I, I, I did exactly that, but as a musician, as a guitar player. So now I'm starting from scratch doing it again. So to me, this is great. And, you know, uh, and I've seen it, I mean, with the composers that I worked with as a musician, as a guitar player, I've, I've seen it, especially with Blake and, and Trevor. I've, I've watched, I've watched it happen over the years. So it's just now I'm on the other side of the, of that experience. Cool. Uh, one question that's kind of connected, uh, and I think maybe Mitchell could go for it because you are in the process right now. You're in school, right? You're finalizing your, um, your school process. Um, how did, how did it happen? Cause you are in school and you were already doing like, you're such a young dude doing some, you know, some great stuff already. How did that work? Did these connections come from school? Did you previously work with people and then you went to school to, you know, how did that work for you? Yeah. So the transition from school to work. So that's something I'm, like you said, I'm currently doing right now. Um, and so like how I built my connections during school um was through a lot of different avenues and the the, the thing that kicked it off first was that uh before even before college i i was using every platform to post like my music and my compositions on and i was working on trying to just get the word out as much as i could i would i would let content creators on platforms such as youtube use it um as long as they uh, gave me credit and eventually built up such an audience that a production company out in uh, the Netherlands uh, reached out to me and uh, they wanted me to score a BMW commercial. Um, so they gave me a shot. And I was, that was, I was super young when that happened um, back in high school, actually. So that was the first, um, that was the first like opportunity that came about that just because I was trying to spread the word as much as possible and then early in college, um, like for pe people that are li like listening in right now who are in college right now, it can't stress it enough that like, work starts now. You don't want to wait until you graduate to build, start building connections and start um, reaching out to, um, to, to contacts. You want to start doing that as soon as possible. And, and that's super important as a composer. So right off the get go, um, in college, I started reaching out to production companies, to composers, anyone that I could talk to, I, I got in front of. Um, and that eventually landed me some internships at a couple of production companies. This was when I was still on Minneapolis at McNally Smith College of Music. Um, and I interned at a production company and then they brought me in as an out-of-house composer, uh, bringing me on a bunch of uh, catalog projects and a bunch of exclusive projects for certain shows and whatnot. Um, and yeah, so that like transitioning from school to work, it shouldn't be much of a transition at all because you want to already have those connections starting to build by the time you graduate. Um, and it, so if you're early in college right now, do everything you can to spread the word um, and make as get in front of as many people as you can, you know, pick as many people's minds as you can, and uh, make that transition as smooth as possible. Yeah, that's uh, that's very valuable advice. Uh, and we very often see see this at school, right? People when they join school, they have this mentality that let's wait until school is over for me to start building something or for right. me to start reaching out to people. And I think it's really cool. Uh, hence for the, the reason why you're, you know, I asked you to be here. Cause I think there, there's that it's like this attitude of we're ready already. We're doing this, right. We're committed to do this. And the, the study portion of it is just like a, a tool, like a networking experience and things like that. So it's really cool. Uh, thanks for sharing that. There is, um, um, uh, one question from Sinem Sanye. I hope I, uh, said that correctly. And I think Toby, uh, I don't know, like I, 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 you know, reading your your bio, the stuff that you you do and you've done, you've done commercials for Airbnb. You've you've also had like a a, a song uh, connected to Spitfire, one of Spitfire's uh, uh, commercials as well, and a, a few other commercials. 
plus you 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 write songs you're part of you're a drummer correct you play drums with different projects and you're also doing the sun project as well um did you feel like that there was like a transition point from being a like let's say a musician instrumentalist songwriter band member to being a composer or was it something like natural it just happened i think it was just belligerence really um I was always terrible at school because I I didn't do well at the stuff that I didn't enjoy doing because uh, I, just, I just didn't want to do it and I didn't want to look into it any more than I absolutely had to. But the stuff that I did enjoy, I did really well at, obviously, because I just spent all my time doing it. So the things that I've done um, kind of that have merged in and out of different industries slightly, I suppose, um, are just because it's what I kind of met I kind of shoehorned those things into my life and just and did them um and and you know I think it it's sort of one of some of the best advice I think I remember receiving um was actually just to keep your jobs uh so if you're not making enough money to um to survive doing exactly what you want to be doing in your time which quite possibly is being a film composer um, you know, don't just jump into the freelance game without anything else going on. And if you can, um, make sure that that job is something that you enjoy. And, and maybe that's, you know, in an area that you, you might like. So obviously, you know, assisting music editing, something that might be in the field of music uh, or film music. Um, because those things can often lead on to things that you do want to do more full time and, and you can get jobs from that. Um, but I know a lot of artists that have kind of just jumped into full freelance mode um, at quite a young age or kind of before they've really had enough, you know, behind them to, to kind of keep them afloat, professionally speaking. And I think um, it's quite hard at the time because people don't want to hear, keep your jobs, really. They just want to get stuck into the industry that they really, really want to be kind of, you know, making a living from. But, you know, it's not always possible. And, and you know, aside from the, the connections that you might get from um, those things, I think just professionally speaking, working with people a lot, um, working in a team or working, you know, more sort of face to face or you know, collaborating with people in in a job, you know, all those skills are really transferable. So when it does come to working with a director, I mean, that Airbnb commercial was um, that was actually a friend of mine. Um, but really difficult to work with, a really difficult character um, professionally for me because I was a really close friend and actually we hadn't kind of got to that uh, professional working relationship yet in our life. We'd known each other for years and all of a sudden we started working together and I was like, oh man, you're actually like really hard work. <laughs> and I don't mean that as a criticism to him, it's, it was more... For me, it was it was I was treating him as if I was just still his friend, you know. But I think in the jobs that you do and the experience that you have, you learn to work in a more professional way. So, yeah, I, I think all of all of these experiences that you have in what might seem like not totally relevant at the time, they come up and help you later on. So, yeah, I would I would say just get experience and, and try to keep your jobs in the early stages. That's cool. Um... Thank you. I, I guess uh, there was more to the question. She's she's asking also like what gear, plugins, and programs uh, you guys suggest uh, to get started. I guess I mean not because you are here, Toby, but like go for the Spitfire uh, products. Uh, again, there is like a free uh, uh, instant access thing. I'm gonna share here on the, the chat uh, in a bit. Uh, but th there's a bunch of companies out there that provide like uh, awesome uh, plugins and instrument uh, uh, virtual instruments that you can go for. Uh, if you guys want to share some of your experiences with that, with plugins and instruments, feel free to chime in. Um, let's mark these done. Uh, and I guess um, uh, they, they already kind of like talked a little bit about how you know, how do you guys advertise or how do you advertise yourselves uh, now in order to land a job? I know that 
all you guys have stuff going on already, are in the field, are composing, are helping, or supporting our other composers. And I guess most of the work now come from these, right? Uh, and I also noticed, sorry, uh, I noticed that, Anne, you also do, you have a channel where you teach some stuff, right? Isn't it right? How, do you, how does that work? Because I guess it's like a, a huge promo tool as well, right? Um, sort of, uh, but not really. It's kind of, it falls more into the question of what do I do in between projects? <laughs> mm, got it. Because I want it to stay productive. And in between, if I have two or three weeks in between movies, I don't necessarily want to write music because I'm just coming out of crunch time. I've just written hours worth of music and produced it and all this stuff. So at that, that point, I'm tired and I'm done with writing for a little bit. So then usually I do, you know, tech tasks like running my backups, optimizing my gear and all this stuff, you know, making purchases or doing my paperwork and taxes and whatnot. But then um, usually that doesn't take that long. And then um, I don't like to get out of the habit of producing stuff, but at the same time, I can't write music. So I was like, well, what am I going to do? And um, a lot of people from guest lectures and panels that I've participated in were asking me if I could, you know, put lectures online or something. And I was like, well, maybe I just start a YouTube channel and I just do mock-ups and walkthroughs and just, um, you know, kind of discuss different things about this industry. And um, yeah, it's been... Um, you know, very well received. I also put making offs of my scores on there as well. So it is kind of also a promotional tool. But um, yeah, most of my promotion really comes through um, either my publicist or through my manager um, sending stuff around or through really recommendations. I mean, for me, 90% of my work at least has come through just people recommending me or me leveraging someone that I know. So if I see a production and I want it, I, you know, go to IMDb and I see, are there any people on this that maybe I have worked with or that have worked with someone that I've worked with? You know, I kind of try to find an angle to get someone to recommend me for it and get me in contact with a person in charge. But that's kind of an angle you can only pull if you've already done some stuff. So I don't know how useful that is. Yeah, I think it's cool that you mentioned, uh, and it's also part of one of the questions, you do have an agent and a manager, a manager, yeah. right? Do you all guys have managers and agents? How do you get the, no? Emir, maybe oh, you go first. Sure. I don't actually at the moment, but uh, I am definitely, you know, would like to uh, get one too eventually because I see uh, it happening uh, agents eventually are uh, the agent uh, route, I guess, is the way to really get the biggest gigs, uh, I think bigger studio jobs and, you know, because they eventually, when there's a big, you know, studio film or something, they uh, usually reach out to the agents and they say, you know, we want these guys or like, you know, at least they send five or 10 of their composers to do the reels for that big job. and um that's usually the connection happens but again of course getting an agent it's a big catch-22 because you should have uh, a big project that you're working on so they can see that actually you're you know able to get gigs by yourself too that you're you know you're proving yourself that uh you're making them happy and you know you're you're completing them successfully so um and composer agents uh are not like, I guess, acting agents, you know, there's way less amount of agents, in L even in LA where the composers are mainly here, uh, it's more of a handful and, you know, there is more competition there for sure. But um, uh, I think it's definitely eventually a very helpful route. And I think, uh, again, that's one of the, unless, of course, you know, you might be neighbors with a big director or producer and, you know, there's always that uh, networking and you might be able to get a big you know movie like that too but then of course probably agents would actually like to you know sign with you anyways after that but um, there's that bit of cash money too there 
Do you guys feel like uh, maybe you and uh, and do you feel like because uh, you guys worked on on projects from your countries, right, from your homelands, right, like from mm-hmm. Germany and from Istanbul, Istanbul, yeah. do you feel that that uh, also helped you guys to start working here in LA when you first moved to LA, or or did you get to work on these projects after you were here already? How did that work? Um, and would you like to go first, or? Uh, sure. Um, I got these projects by um, being in LA, actually. So <laughs> I did not get yeah. the German productions and the Dutch and Belgian productions by being there. I got them by being in LA. And then uh, either director, producer, or composer here in LA that I worked with had connections to those productions or you know, they were collaborating and then they recommended me. So that actually was an LA thing <laughs> and not a Germany thing. Same for me too. The, you know, the fact that I'm here and doing the work here definitely uh, has an impressive, impressive feel, I guess. Uh, and they definitely would like to you know, work a Turkish composer that's already working in Los Angeles. That's a desirable thing. Uh, in terms of projects there, you know, usually they're not like, I mean, if I do a big project, there is not necessarily related to here. Uh, it's just a big, you know, job there. But uh, I definitely done tons of commercials for Turkey and you know, some other projects. So it, it's fun. It's, it's it's a very proud thing to be able to do it for my country too. So it's always um, I enjoy doing it. I don't know if you agree with that, but I definitely feel like you can leverage Los Angeles more overseas than you can leverage overseas stuff in Los Angeles. Completely, exactly. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, that's that's certainly a thing. Um, uh, there's also uh, one of the questions here from Manuel. Uh, he's asking about workflows in film to V. There's also another question here. Uh, video on demand, like how does it work? You know, like uh, what are the general terms? I mean, maybe and again and Amir, because you guys, I know you guys worked on projects like similar projects. Uh, if there, I remember chatting with Amir once about that, like, how does it work with the team? Like, you get the tracks from someone, you get like a template from, from you know, from the director or whatever. How does it work uh, uh, when you're doing like a VOD uh, projects? Um, yeah. In terms of the process of getting yeah. a project from them, uh, usually music uh is one of the later stages in film production and post-production. So we're, we and like, I guess sound design, and I guess usually CGI too, but like we're the last people. So technically, ideally, you know, it's the best if we get a locked cut and then we work uh, with locked cut, which is usually not the case anymore, it used to be. <laughs> but um, uh, we, there's the spotting session, it's called spotting session, where you, you know, meet with directors, producers, whoever is in charge, and uh, there's a temp track, as you mentioned, usually um, where it's a whole different world of discussion, uh, which I personally like temp tracks because it's usually, it's very helpful where they you know, put music, pre-existing music on film, uh, and um, that's, helps what they like or what they don't like. And there's also some, of course, something called temp love, which they might be really attached to the temp uh, where you have to, uh, you know, um, carefully, you know, get close to it, but, you know, just do your own original thing. But, um, but yeah, in terms of team goes, we get the picture and uh, I mean, it's every, every project is different depending on how many, um, the way you know they would like to work. Sometimes it even starts with the script before even you know some people like actually sending the script and you get the idea. If there's any kind of uh, uh, sometimes they would like you to actually write suites or themes before even seeing a picture. That helps too. And I personally like working with picture. Like it, it's definitely way more effective for me to see. Uh, I mean, I can get an idea from a script in terms of you know. The, the story and everything but definitely the picture dictates for me um, what it needs and um, yeah and anything like that 
Yeah, definitely uh, similar to your experience. Um, I would also say the collaboration really heavily depends on how well you know the filmmakers. Because if I take Fearless, for example, I knew that producer or those two producers that I worked with that hired me for that. I had already done like 15 productions with them. So we didn't even have a spotting session. They just gave me the movie with some temp music in it. And we're like, we had like a half hour phone call. And then they were just like, okay, write themes and then do your thing. And we'll, we'll stop you if we don't like something. But if we don't say anything, just keep going. Because we knew each other so well. But then on the other hand, sometimes you work with someone for the first time and then there's a lot more back and forth, figuring out what they like, what they want, what they dislike, you know, so it's very different for each project. My process for composition tends to be the same where I start to write themes first or theme suites before I start working actually with a picture. Um, and then once those themes are approved, that's when basically my team, my internal team comes in and then we um, start writing to picture and uh, they start writing the additional music and you know the orchestrator comes in and creates the sheet music and all that stuff. But um, yeah, otherwise uh, the process before that is really very similar to, to what you're describing. And I'd like to add the, the director-composer relationship part of it. It's a very important, you know, it's a very famous, uh, I mean, in history too, like Steven Spielberg, John Williams, Robert Zemeckis, Alan Silvestri, you know, like if once you start like knowing, that's why for uh, people who are getting into it too, like if you actually it meet, like I actually met amazing directors at, uh, uh, in LA in film schools and they start doing great uh their own great jobs and I, they kept hiring me because I did their students films originally and uh, eventually you know exactly how we work together and it just becomes easier and more productive. Do you ever um, work more with producers than the director because I always hear that director composer relationship but if I look at most of my stuff it's actually a producer composer relationship. I very often don't even meet the director and the director is not the person who chooses me it's the producers that choose me so i'm very much a producer's composer uh have you had like similar experiences oh uh, mostly it's been directors with me actually <laughs> but uh, i mean i i know again like you know sometimes direct and you know, producers have more to say in a production uh that they're the ones who are hiring but sometimes if the director you know is really you know, if they, if they really like what you're doing, they can, you know, convince the producer to hire you and then um, go from there. I was um, just going to mention a couple of um, weird projects I've had since the pandemic. I think that's kind of changed things maybe slightly, um, obviously, but in terms of this relationship, um, you know, I've worked on a film, actually a short film about the pandemic earlier this year, uh, last year. And um, that was a director um, that I had got in touch with because uh, I saw his work and it, it kind of, it worked. We kind of liked what each other did. Uh, we never spoke, um, we never met. Um, we just did everything over email. Um, and I think the internet is really a tool that might be helping the way people get work right now in a, in a different way. Um, I, I think, you know, people already obviously using the internet um, to kind of build relationships and to meet people. But I think now more than ever, because people literally can't, uh, it's it, people may be kind of trying to really sort of hone in on exactly who and how they want to work um, and with who. Um, and again, another one off the back of that at the moment, another short film for Vimeo, um, working with the director from Georgia, Atlanta, never, never met her. Um, we had a Zoom call and we, we talked about the mood. We, she hadn't shot anything yet. And we ended up, she ended up sending a load of photos, um, which has kind of painted this picture so far. And I've started to work with that. She's kind of into it and um, just getting the, 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 the kind of film through at the moment um, but it's kind of interesting I think we actually hosted a panel as part of my work at Spitfire about um, talking with composers about their work 
in the pandemic and how it's changed. And obviously it's a bit of a sore spot for some people, but it's, I think, interesting for people that are looking to get into the industry at the moment. Um, and one of the topics was, you know, is it still important to be in LA or in London or a major European city? And, um, you know, is, is it still right now something that you need to, is it going to change people's workflow going forward and how people build relationships? And I think, yeah, of course, of course it is. It's, okay. it's changing everything and the way people interact with each other and, and how people find their work. So it's, I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a strange, like, new time for, for this uh, director-composer relationship. And I think it's, if you're starting, actually, I think that you could probably do quite well out of, sort of pioneering some new ways of meeting people and hitting them up and getting in touch. And as, as Mitchell, you were saying, just putting your, your work in front of people's faces, you know, just kind of actively. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, and and you also you mentioned at the beginning that you reached out to this uh, director, right? You are the one actually. Hey, love your work, whatever. Let's. Yeah, I was just kind of browsing Vimeo staff picks. Um, just from now, now just times time, I kind of find myself on their homepage and just finding out what filmmakers are up to at the moment and I find that it's always quite an interesting place like um, usually I'll, I'll browse for about an hour or half an hour maybe and I'll normally find one or two short films that really seem very interesting and um, yeah one of those I got in touch with uh, and he actually needed some music for another uh, Vimeo feature that he was working on kind of there and then um, and I think there's something about striking whilst the iron's hot because with the directors, they just put out their work. They're really excited about their connections and who they can meet off the back of what they've just done too. So it kind of works both ways, I think. And um, so, yeah, he was just, he got back in straight away, like email, he's, he's based in New York. And um, he was just like, yeah, let's love your work and let's, let's work on something. Um, and then this new one is, is um, from a, uh, a director who has been commissioned to make her first kind of, uh, yeah, uh, stories in place for Vimeo piece. And um, she she's never worked with a composer before, <laughs> which is kind of interesting because she's like, I don't know what I'm doing, do you? And I'm just like, no, maybe, I don't know, let's see how it goes. And it's been very organic and a lot of back and forth. and. But she saw the, the original one that I had done for um, his name's Lo Chan about the pandemic earlier in the year. And so she needed to put a team together and she went on uh, the front page of Vimeo and started looking for stuff and, and she was looking for composers. And so that's how that worked. Yeah, that's super cool. Uh, it's, it was actually a question from Anton Cassis asking if it's possible to be, you know, to reach out to the hubs of the industry like LA and UK you know, without being at these locations or being on the other side of the planet, you just answered that. Does anybody else have anything to add to that? Uh, maybe Greco too, right? Greco has toured with a bunch of people from all over the world and he's written music and produced people from all over the world. Do you feel like being in LA today, especially after what we've gone through, do you feel like it's still like a necessity or you can still make stuff happen? Uh, I'm trying to figure that one out. Um, actually hearing Toby speak about that. Yeah. Uh, there is a part of me that thinks that um, perhaps not, perhaps you can do everything online, but again, if you want to, if, if we want to then follow the path of, you know, becoming an assistant and I think that, what Toby just talked about works for two paths, you know, for the artist path and for the indie world path, you know, and for the path where you become an assistant to a composer, you have to, I, you still have to be at a major hub because, you know, the people that live here or maybe in London or, you know, the hubs in the world, that, that's where you need to be to be an assistant to somebody that you are inspired by. But uh, as far as uh, developing developing your voice as an artist and and using that to transition into 
uh, film music, film music, and also the indie world thing where you reach out to Vimeo directors, which is something that I've done as well, not quite successfully or as successfully as Toby, but I've, I've done that. Uh, there's Kickstarter where you, you know, do a sweep of the projects that are almost fully funded, or perhaps they have been green lighted and you reach out to the directors or producers and, you know, offer your services. Um, and I've, I know of composer friends who have done that. And uh, I think that is about establishing relationships more than anything. It's just saying, hi, saying hi mm. and presenting yourself, introducing yourself. And, you know, um, perhaps something will come out of it, perhaps not, but it's, uh, I think it's part of the work or part of the, of, of the uh, work ethic that the modern composer needs to have or the person starting out like myself in this business is um you know and again i've i've i think i've done quite well being a musician and playing guitar for artists and composers and stuff like that uh, i don't don't consider myself to be an a-lister um uh, but in it works the same way in any in any industry. You have to prove that you can be dependable and trustworthy, and you can save the day, hopefully, in one opportunity or another. So, yes, Toby, go ahead. Just a question for you, Greco, and and um, for the rest of you as well. Did you did you have a project? I mean, presumably, Greco, you were already working in LA from your previous experience. But um, yes. did you did you have projects that kind of brought you to LA, or do you do it the other way around? Do you go to LA first, and then you're like. I, yeah, let's go. Or, you know, how does that work? Uh, no, I came here to, to go to school and then I stayed. And then what happened was um, I was playing at the school's gospel choir. And the guitar player who was, uh, I actually was subbing for her when the call for a gig came through and she said, well, I'm not going to be in town. I'm going to be back in Japan. Can you sub for me? So I sub for her and then I met somebody that worked in a church in South Central LA and then they liked what I did and they were like, well, do you want to come play with us in church? And I'm like, sure. And then that kind of, that kind of got things going, mm -hmm. you know, it's, but I, I was, I came here to study and then I didn't know what, what was going to happen. I just knew that I, I was going to stay and have a go at it. Nice. That was pretty much the same for me. Um, I came here to study, but also with the intention of at least interning for other composers and, you know, possibly, you know, getting an assistantship. And I just knew that, you know, the kinds of composers that have so much work overhead and the finances to have assistants or interns, those would be either here or probably in London, I would presume, but much more in Los Angeles. I mean, there's a reason why all of these people are here. And um, yeah, that, that for me was the journey. And I also knew that I wanted to work on studio productions and I still do. And I just know that in order to do that, 99% of the time you just have to be here. You know, you have to um, gain their trust as, as Greco was saying, you have to be on their radar for years and years on end and you know save the day a couple of times i mean in order for me to get fearless i had to do probably um 10 other movies first and do a lot of favors before i got to have that and um also you know to be an assistant i hear i hear a lot of people always saying you know i first want a job lined up before i come to la but it just kind of doesn't work like that you know yeah people don't just <laughs> hire someone randomly yeah. from the other side of the planet and just go yeah let's let's try out that person very often when i was called in to help anybody out it was like a 24-hour turnaround it was like hey we heard through this person that you know how to you know, do this t kind of tech task, we need that tomorrow. Can you come in tomorrow? So there's no time to get someone a visa and yeah. to, you know, fly them in and have them get settled and all this stuff. Usually um, both for movies that I'm doing here, but also for any type of assistant thing, it was usually a, hey, we need this. Can you do this now? Um, 
Like I remember being called in, for example, uh, one time Steve Jablonski's rig went down, his home rig, and his assistant, it was Christmas Day, his assistant was with her family in a different state. So she called me because I still had the access code and the key card and I knew how to turn off the alarm because um, that's also a thing. Obviously, there's high security in all of these facilities. Um, and she was like, can you help me out? I'm not there right now. Can you go to this place and do this thing and then go to the other studio, exchange these parts and make it work again because he has to start working the day after Christmas. So that's how I spend my Christmas day. And I didn't know that, you know, up until 9 a.m. in the morning that I would be spending my Christmas day that way. And that's just the reality of, of being here and how you get opportunities. You just have to be there when the house is on fire so that you can put out the fire and then people will be appreciative and recommend you to the next person and go, oh, wow, she really helped us out on this one. You should get her to do that. And then, you know, it just kind of goes on and on that way. And um, I just don't see how that could naturally happen if you're not in a media hub where there is this kind of demand. Right. And I, I was just going to add on to what I agree with both of you guys and say that, yeah, because I'm, I'm here to study in L.A. right now. I was going to the college in Minneapolis, um, had some great opportunities there for um, composing for ads and TV. And then I came out here to LA to continue or finish my degree at LAC. And yeah, like some, um, there's a lot of opportunities that only come from being in LA or being in a hub. Like, like prime example is the whole composer assistant thing. I would not have this opportunity um, being a composer assistant right now if I was not in LA. Uh, so yeah, but and at the same time, you can be reaching out to production companies that are always looking for music, no matter what city uh, they're in. Um, and of course, I was doing that before I even made the move to LA, so that at least helped the transition a little bit. So I, th I think, yeah, exactly like what Greco was saying, it all depends on what route you're going. Some routes work better if you're uh, actually there in the hub. So. Yeah, and you know, I'm I'm gonna add something quick. I was listening to uh, something came up on the perspective uh, uh, group on Facebook, and it, like an episode of SoundCloud with Johan Johansson, and he was talking about his experience and it going back to Toby. I mean, and I've you know, and I equate him to one of these few people that there are artists first, and then. Hollywood comes knocking on their door, right? So I would say that, in my opinion, like Ryuchi Sakamoto is like that. Gustavo Santaolaja is like that. Johan Johansson is like that. So for, it's a different route. And then they kind of did what they doing. And at one point, you know, Hollywood decided that, oh my God, this music is amazing. I want to add this to my movie. And then that, that happened. So what Toby was doing is doing is to me seems like that route. And I think that it's also a part of the ethos of Spitfire, as far as I can tell from the videos and the stuff that I've seen online, you know, they have a record label and they, they are trying to democratize the idea of, of um, film composing and making it accessible for people that otherwise, uh, would think that, oh, I need to go to college or, and I'm not saying that you don't, uh, but it's just, uh, you know, it's not about knowing how to orchestrate for a 24 piece orchestra. At the end of the day is whether you have the idea or not. It's whether your music is gonna fit with the vision of the director or with the picture, or if you're gonna, you know, uh, invoke an emotional response from the director, producer, and consequently the viewers. Um, so, you know, having said that, it's both ways work. And I think that it's something that as composers, you kind of need to figure out which one you want to pursue. Okay, do I want to do my thing and 
you know, I'm going to be an artist and then I'm going to do my music and that's going to be it. Or, oh, do I want to learn how to write for this specific type of thing and then do it on demand and have these deadlines and, and you know, do one thing one day and another style the next day. Or So it's something that you have to think about, you know, it's like, okay, which route am I going to take? I think it also really depends on, you know, what's the end goal, you know, um, like if you want to do library music, you can absolutely make a living library music. Plenty of people are um, making a very comfortable living doing that. Um, but you can do that from anywhere. You don't have to be in a media hub and, you know, have all these expenses to do that. Um, you know, or if you want to work on French art movies, you probably don't have to be in LA. I mean, that would probably be counterproductive. Um, you know, for me, it was the choice that I made early on in college in Europe already. Um, I want to work on studio productions. And in order to have that, the highest likelihood of getting that is by going where those productions are made, where those decision makers are. But if that's not someone's goal, or if the assistant route isn't someone's goal, then there's much less reason to be in a media hub where all those people are, of course. Yeah, I just remembered one more, uh, an acquaintance of mine. When I did a, I did a tour in 2008 with Katie Lang and the opening, our opening act was a guy named, a piano player called Dustin O'Halloran. And at that time, he was like, no, I'm going to move, you know, I'm going to move to Berlin because that's where I, you know, he had been to Berlin and he loved the scene and, you know, and okay. So, you know, he, he was doing instrumental piano based music, beautiful music. He moved to Berlin and then started his whole thing. And then he met, and I'm going to mispronounce his name. Please forgive me. Hauschka, I think it's his name. And then they worked on, you know, a number of projects and then eventually got an Oscar nomination for Lion. And then now they have uh, Ammonite or something like that. So again, it, the path of the artist thing, he is, you know, he, he went to Berlin to pursue that and it worked for him because he knew what he wanted to do. Especially Berlin is a good place to be for, you know, electronic music or uh, the artsy type stuff. Uh, it has a very thriving art scene. I think Hildur Gutnadottir, I think is her last name, <laughs> um, also lives in Berlin and, and collaborated with Johan Johansson there. So um, yeah, if that's the scene you're in, that makes perfect sense to be in a location where the scene of that particular thing is thriving, of course. And speaking of Berlin, uh, Native Instruments is based on Berlin too, <laughs> as you guys know. And um, there, I'm sure, like, you know, for sound designers and for that's a whole different route, of course, but uh, there are a lot of companies and Spitfire, obviously, in England, in, in Europe has a lot of great um, um, opportunities for also uh, working for, you know, software companies or sample companies. Yeah, Orchestral Tools is in Berlin as well. Yeah. And also Berlin has a really great scoring stage called Teldex. So there's there's certainly opportunities. Yeah. That's cool. Wow. Uh, Toby, did you want to uh, add anything or you're good? Um, yeah, I just I think I, I was just making the point of uh, the, the pandemic, I think, is just is, is the current um, ripples being sent that is just maybe affecting traditional routes of working and yeah, I think yeah. um, you know it, everyone's illustrating the point that basically careers are such beautiful things because they all have these extremely bizarre paths and everybody's is unique and I think it's a mistake to try and look at one individual and be like right I, I'm going to do exactly yeah. what they <laughs> you know because it just doesn't work like that and I think you know the bottom line is uh, for me anyway, it's like the more lottery tickets you win, the, the better the chance that you'll win the jackpot, right? It's like you, you make your opportunities and you, and you make your own luck. So, um, yeah. Yeah, and I think, I'm sorry, go ahead, Amir. Go ahead. No, 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 go for it, man. I was going to say, I was going to add with for the, the, you know, the pandemic part, uh, what I've been seeing actually is the remote 
you know, that certain things can be done definitely remotely, that we're kind of figuring that out more and more. And what I've been kind of doing recently is uh, doing sessions like as a player too, uh, even like some arranging gigs I've done uh, through you know, all these plugins that we discovered, they were already existing before, but like audio movers, you know, Source Connect was always there, but Cubase has VSD Connect Pro, like they're amazing, like for in terms of collaborating like real time and, I actually participated in a big orchestral recording a few months ago uh, in LA, and they had IMAX literally on the orchestra with the camera, so the producers can watch it, you know, and hear it perfectly full sound. You know, I mean, the European orchestra sessions, and you know, uh, has been done for years through Source Connect and things like that. But uh, in terms of collaborating, you know, instead of just going to a studio, you can definitely. We were realizing that you know, more can be done like remotely as well, which kind of eliminates the time of driving or traveling. <laughs> I think it's definitely helpful. Yeah, and I think Toby is, is, is right. I, I don't disagree with him. I think things did change and we're going to learn more about how much and how deeply they have changed as we, uh, as, as the year goes by and next year comes along and, I think, you know, it, it'll be different for sure. It's, yeah, I don't think we're going back to whatever it was. I really like the pioneering concept. I think that's that's a, a, a big thing, you know, like people who are pioneering the new ways are. Um, yeah, that's that's really cool. Uh, Emir, you just touched a little bit on arrangements and there's a question about that. Do you guys do uh, a lot of arrangement work? Uh, other than just like composing, do you guys get gigs where like you have to arrange for a composer or, or something like that? Yeah, a lot. I mean, I did a lot. I've always done it a lot. Uh, as you know, Anne was mentioning too, but for her internal team thing, you know, we're, we're enough. A lot of composers, there are just um, uh, not enough hours in a day for most of the time for you know, if you have a few TV shows or, you know, multiple projects going on. It's just, there's so much work sometimes that where, you know, you have to hire uh, a team basically can be programmers, arrangers, additional music, and it's a very common thing. Um, lately, I guess for the last 15, 20 years, maybe, and maybe even more, but uh, it's um, um, you take you know the main theme or the themes that the composers came up with and uh, apply it to scenes, and you know, they can start. Uh, maybe mucking up with like few sounds, but like you finish it, you know, by adding more things. It's like there's it happens all the time, and um, it's part of uh, the world now. Yeah, one of the topics here was uh like payment, money, right? How does payment work in the world of composing and, and things like that? Maybe uh, we can start, you know, like when when you're arranging for projects like that. Do you usually does the usually does the project usually pay? per hour, per project? How does it work? Either arranging or composing, you guys who are composing. I've worked on projects where the arrangements, a couple times where it was actually paid by the production company, which is mm -hmm. rare, but uh, that has happened. But most of the time, uh, it's the composer who's hiring to arrange is like, you know, for that part, like additional music or any kind of score programming or something. Usually the composer, it's part of the composer's fee their own package so you get paid from them directly uh, but in terms it's usually never well sometimes but usually for me it's more of a package number rather than an hourly number i yeah. rarely work hourly um, so it's per project you know it's like a, a deal that you know we make in the beginning this is how much we have this is you know it's basically that uh, because as Anne said you know the the hours in this industry can be very, uh, I mean, you know, the sleep, it can be a very luxury most of the time. And it, it's, uh, and it's all deadline based. So uh, whenever it can be done and music usually uh, is because it's the last part, you know, I mean, we I've always, I mean, I, there's so many Christmases, New Year's Eves and, you know, holidays that I work, you know, it doesn't feel really matter because they want the music when they come back from, holidays so you have to like have it done <laughs> so um uh that's why usually payments are more at least in my experience it's a package deal yeah 
And as part of the question, do you guys, for example, Anne, you have a few shows on Netflix. Do you get paid, just like Emir said, you get paid like an X amount of uh, money for the project. Plus, whenever the show plays, you get your royalties. Um, can you? Um, I mean, different services, first of all, I, I compensate it differently. For example, when I was, um, if you're a full-time studio assistant or when I was working at Cine Samples, I was on salary. So I would just get a monthly income no matter what we were working on. And then um, when I went freelance as an assistant, I was hourly. So someone would have me at their studio and I would log my hours and get an hourly rate for that. Um, when I'm doing additional music, which isn't that often anymore, you would get a per minute rate. So for every minute you write, you get a set uh, rate. Sometimes it's a weekly rate, but that's rare. Um, I know music editors get weekly rates or day rates. Same with mixing engineers, they get day rates. Um, and then um, sometimes you get a flat rate for something. But as a composer, there are usually, for me, two ways to go about this. Either I get a package deal, um, which is, for me, roughly 50% of the time, um, where they just give me the entire music budget and I have to pay everything out of that, including myself. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're the lead composer, you definitely uh, should get the writer's share of the music. Sometimes on low budget productions, you can also argue for the publisher's share. But so you do get royalties later on as well on top of the upfront fee. Um, and other times I get a non-package deal, meaning I get a creative fee but then uh, there are extra expenses that I don't have to pay for out of that. And the recording budget is separate as well. So I never see that kind of money. It's just handled by the production. So there are different ways to go about this. Um, but yeah, royalties are uh, kind of a hot topic right now because mm -hmm. traditionally TV pays a lot of royalties, traditional TV. Um, and you get royalties, of course, from radio play and from, um, you know, stuff on the Internet. And you get in everywhere except the United States, you also get royalties for theatrical performances, which has been my main royalty income so far. But streaming services are handled differently um, because you don't get set rates. So in a European theater, for example, if the movie plays, and you own 100% of the writer's share, for example, of your music, then it doesn't matter if there's one person in the theater or 100 people in that theater, you still get the same amount of money for that play. Uh, streaming services don't work the same way. They take the subscription money, a portion of that subscription money, uh, since they don't have ads, goes into royalty payouts and... Um, that goes by the percentage of how much your title was played. And so sometimes you have the issue, if you're on a streaming service with say the Avengers, you're probably gonna lose next to, you know, something like that if you just work in a mid-sized production because it's not going to be watched as much as those top titles. And so those titles are gonna get the biggest piece of the pie. So, um, I think this is also how paid TV used to work. Um, so there are different systems on how this is going. And I think um, going forward, there's definitely going to be some discussion, especially as streaming services are getting more and more popularity and power, especially now. Um, a lot of people, a lot of composers are seeing a lot of um, you know, deficit in terms of royalties because the streaming services pay so much less um, because there's no lawmaking in place. Uh, they don't have to give us the numbers. They don't um, have to tell us how often a title was played. And, you know, they don't have to disclose anything. Whereas if your stuff plays on regular TV, they have to have cue sheets and yeah. lists submitted and everything is tracked and when it played, where it played, how many people were watching. But so there's currently no law that requires streaming services to do that. And so um, that's kind of been a bit of a hot topic currently for performing rights organizations around the world to see how we can make those payouts, you know, fair or at least um, 
you know, get them to a level where when traditional TV goes away, which it will eventually, that it can still survive off of the royalties. That's a masterclass topic right there. We have one actually on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to discuss like uh, royalties and things like that. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. It's really, really cool. Um, I, re I, I particularly like that uh, realm of music. So it's cool. Um, there is one question here. Um, uh, do, do you guys, any, do any of you guys want to add anything to, to this, to the money part? Like maybe, I don't know, like uh, Toby and Mitchell, you guys worked on commercials, right? On, 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 like, how does it work on commercials? Like, do you guys have a flat rate or does it work similar to what Anne was describing? Yeah, so it all depends on if the music's, if the music's not exclusive or exclusive, if, the, if, you, if you're working directly with the, the ad agency, if you're working through a production company, uh, through my experience, I worked through production companies that um, my music is placed in commercials, both through music that they already represent of mine, uh, so that's non-exclusive placements. And then also projects come along every once in a while that are exclusive. They actually have the commercial, they've got the cut, we score to it, or their in-house team takes the music and like existing music and cuts it up to actually fit the picture a little bit better. Um, but in terms of payment, um, is typically how a production company works with the uh, commercials is that it's usually split 50, 50 for the sync fee. And the sync fee is the upfront fee that you get for that commercial. Um, and then and that's the same thing with the uh, exclusive as well, but with exclusive, you're typically looking at a higher budget, um, non-exclusive is just as, um, it's just as nice to see to, to see as royalties for TV because um, those are just completely passive. Um, but then with like with TV, um, what, what happens a lot is that the TV royalties, a lot of the production companies that I work with, they give the music to the uh, to the network uh, on gratis. They uh, let them have it for no sync fee and then they will collect the royalties from that just because TV royalties are that good um so yeah that's that's how that's my experience with the uh, royalties and payment awesome uh, another thing that kind of like you guys mentioned that you do you do also uh do additional music for composers right uh, amir mentioned that too and mentioned that too do you guys get credited uh uh or included on the cue sheet for residuals does that work when you're like additioning composing uh, yes, most of the time, uh, it's you know there is always a percentage that's kind of in discretion of you know composer or um, sometimes production company, but mostly I guess the composer. And uh, there are some standards, but it's like very per it can be very personal and just you know based on negotiation. But yes, uh, you know in many movies these days, if you just watch the end credits, you will see additional music you know credits, and um, which reflects on the cue sheets as well. Oh, anyone else? And I, I will say that um, I've kind of had a 50-50 experience with that. In the ideal situation, you would be getting cue sheet. Yes, you would be getting somewhere around, I don't know, 20, 25 percent or more of the cue sheet, depending on how much you wrote of the cues that you wrote, just the pieces that you actually did. Um, but there are a lot of composers currently also that um, basically create ghostwriters which means you're not getting anything you're getting an upfront fee and then wow, that's I, was, it. I was just gonna ask about ghostwriting <laughs> that's the thing i mean um i've certainly done it my fair share and i think all of my friends have done it their fair share it's um unfortunately common sometimes there are political reasons and then some composers have um at least the decency to say okay we're gonna pay you a lot more upfront because we know you're not going to collect royalties later on. But um, more often than not, it's um, just the composer not wanting to give the due credit and the due cue sheet. And personally, I have very strong opinions about that, having been at the receiving end of that. And um, 
I personally think that's absolutely wrong. Everybody who creatively contributed should be getting a piece of the pie, pretty much. Sometimes in awards too, though, like I think like Emmys and things like that, you know, there is there uh, there is a criteria where you have certain more than certain amount of other names that you might not be uh, eligible to get an award. So that could be a factor too, I think. But I, I guess I agree with Anne. You know, that that should probably be changed too. <laughs> I mean, if ghostwriters did that much of the work that you wouldn't qualify for an award because you did so much of the work that your percentage would be so high that you technically would have to be nominated, then right. that title probably shouldn't be up for contention in the first place. And it's like, you know, visual effects, like, you know, you see like thousands of names, but, you know, in usually music, there is like, you cannot really mention it as much, you know, so <laughs> there's a, it's a different <laughs> That's true. Yeah. That's cool. Anyone else? All right. So there's one question here. It's a long question. Uh, first, I guess we all kind of like talked a little bit about this already, but like, what would you guys, uh, what do you guys think it would be the best way to get, you know, music, like as an artist, like a singer songwriter, right? Like how, what's the best way for me to get my music uh, in the right hands to lend placements for film and tv and etc i guess maybe uh greco you want to uh well the, ex the few experiences i've had with that was because i think the last song i had was in a movie called last vegas and it was because i co-wrote the song with a friend of mine and she was friends with the director and the director called her and said, hey, you know, or he had heard the song. It's like, I love that song. I want to use it in the movie. Great. So that's one thing. Music supervisors. Uh, and then there's a whole separate conversation about that. Um, you know, I think, I think a way of doing that is getting your music out there, um, meeting mu music supervisors. I'm sure there are some Facebook groups, um, perhaps in your network of people that you know, you know somebody who knows a music supervisor and taking the, the Toby approach, getting in touch with these people and say, hey, I've done it. It's like, hey, I have some music and I would like you to check it out. Um, and I think there are some agencies, uh, I have some friends here in LA that, that usually post about this, you know, oh, thank you so-and-so for, for using my music for the show. But I don't know if those are needle, needle drops, as they call it, or something that, you know, the director specifically asked for that. And I'm talking about independent songwriters, right? Um, you know, getting your music out there. I think that's the, you know, if you're a singer songwriter, you need to promote your, your music, get it yeah. out there. Because you never know, somebody's going to listen to it. It's like, hey, that's exactly what I'm looking for. You know, yeah, just uh, to, just to echo that, I think I think that's the best way of trying to get to that end goal. Um, I think it's very difficult to directly um, put your music in front of somebody that's going to make a decision about them placing it in their ad or TV or, or film. Um, I think that the way that supervisors or directors or anybody who's going to look for music is having come across something already. Um, so that will be discovering it on, on a channel somewhere, whether that's YouTube or social media or, you know, Bandcamp or seeing a review of an album somewhere. You know, it's like that's the way around that journey normally goes, I think. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know about that, but it seems like... And... and and on that note, actually, just um, the, the only thing that I could think to counter that, that would be um, titling, which sometimes I've noticed can um, can work if you've if you've got an album or a track title that lends itself to the kind of mood of the music, and if you've got somebody who's feeling a little bit lazy, or they might just be thinking about. Um, some kind of space nebula music they need for that show and actually uh they've just typed it in somewhere and it's come up on some kind of 
search result. But generally speaking, I feel like uh, what Greco you just mentioned there is just getting your music out there on, on a multitude of different channels first for people to hear to then make a decision about. Yeah, and you know, for I did a few ads, uh, but they were all they were all um, contracted by this acquaintance of mine or a friend who lives in and he works with production companies in Japan. So at one point he was like, "Hey, I'm looking for," but again, he knew me as a singer songwriter. He had heard my stuff, and he's like, "Hey, we're looking for this kind of stuff." Um, can you submit something? I was like, yeah, sure. And I think it was like three or five people that submitted stuff. And I ended up getting the job, but it was, bef- you know, because he knew me as, oh, I think, yeah, I know you do that kind of stuff. Can you send me a, a, a demo? They, they want to hear you. Okay. You know, and then you still have to, you know, to submit your work and know that, you know, most of the times you're going to be, you're not going to be the only one submitting. Uh, and, you know, hopefully you get the gig but sometimes you won't and you know that's all part of the thing yeah and i i also would like to add to that i think the the uh going back to you know the essence of what we're doing here right now the sense of community i think it's really valuable for artists to um, think a little bit outside of the, the, you know, the traditional ways of getting your song exposed to music supervisors or things like that. Uh, maybe start creating these kind of things, you know, these uh, groups where you invite people to talk and you invite people to share their experiences. You start building your connections like these, your networking, uh, so that eventually your music will be there, right? You're going to be able to... Uh, 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 I think I think it's really power. This sense of and, and if we look at history, like everything that's huge today, like all the apps, all the platforms, all the major companies, they all they were all born f- like from this sense of community. People like sharing their like whatever purchase experience, like Amazon. People sharing their experiences, purchasing a certain product and things like that. So I think that like building a community and having your music in the background of this community uh, is a great plus. There is one question here that uh, Toby was uh, talking a little bit and, and just like got my attention. Like you do a lot of things, right? You, you Again, you're a drummer, you composed, uh, you've done commercial, like music for commercial, you have the Sun uh, project. How do you feel like, um, uh, I'm going to read here. I consider myself a, re- a composer, songwriter. Blah, blah. How should I position myself when I have so many things in music? What's your take on that? Yeah, I don't really have a answer for that. I struggle with that <laughs> myself. Um, I think it's, um, yeah, it's, if you have a, I mean, in some ways, if you have a real clear cut uh, profession that's really honed in and you are that person and you do nothing else, in a way, it can be very helpful because people know you as this person, you're the go-to for that task. And, um, you know, obviously there's, there's that you can apply that in, in, all, in all genres of, of professional life and, um it, it can really really help people out if if you carve out a real niche and stick to that um yeah i it's for me it's it's not that um my experience has been different um and it's been that way because i enjoy doing different things i, I find you know and you mentioned earlier when you've been composing for like you've been on a job for two weeks straight and then you've got your downtime the last thing you want to do is go and like write music for fun because you're done you've you you need some time away from that and the the kind of benefits I see as being somebody that's a bit more multidisciplinary I I suppose is is that I feel kind of more engaged when I come back to the, the, the other task or the other creative outlet um, and I feel refreshed when I go back to the, the original. So, um, yeah, it's difficult to present yourself if you do a couple of things um, in, a, in a single kind of elevator pitch, um, but it can have its benefits too.
Uh -huh. I was mute. Sorry. Uh, I was. Yeah. And did you want to say something? Um, yeah, I mean, for me, it's been the opposite. I feel similar to Amir, um, who said earlier that it's it would be very difficult for him to be a full time pianist and a full time composer. Um, because I also come from being a musician, um, but yeah, doing this composing thing full time, it's so all consuming that I just, I personally don't see how I could have done anything else on the side. And I think it, it was an advantage that I was so singular minded about it, that that was the one thing that I wanted and every little bit of energy that I had went into pursuing just that. Um, it can be a bit more difficult. Uh, Toby mentioned that, you know, it's harder maybe if you do so many things to do an elevator pitch. I would say maybe the opposite can happen. Um, there was a time where I was known, you know, amongst the LA community as the assistant, the person who comes in to do tech work and the person who does additional music or orchestration and um, it's kind of, there comes a point where it gets very difficult tr to transition out of something if you've been pigeonholed into that. So um, for me, I had to turn down a lot of assisting at some point because I was just like, I need to get out of that and just not be known for that anymore. I don't want people to call me to fix the computer anymore. You know, I, I want people to call me just to write music. And so um, it's also very dangerous if you are so focused on pursuing one thing to really get into one thing and then get stuck there. So there's, I think there's two perspectives on this um, and both are probably perfectly valid. Yeah, it's the typecasting thing, you know, where, you know, if you get known as one thing, it's very easy to get stuck. I mean, but it's also, you know, it's a personal thing too. Like I, you know, we, some, we all, you know, are capable of, you know, if, if you're an instrumentalist, you know, you're good at what you do. You can be a good composer. You can be a good arranger. You can be a good tech person. Like I personally like mixing a lot, you know, but if I, if they start knowing me and even genres, like I'm like good, at, you know, I feel comfortable with jazz, you know, whether with action, you know, all the different genres. Too. But once you start getting known by one thing, you're that, oh, I'm really good at, you know, you know, jazz, piano player, whatever, you know, and, and then, uh, it's sometimes hard to get out of it. So the focusing is good too, but at the same time, what fulfills you? I mean, I kind of enjoy doing it all too. So I try to do it as much as I can. <laughs> and just to add on, like working with production companies, since that's what I do primarily, they're like with their in-house guys, they want the guys that work at in-house at production companies for commercials and uh, ads and TV, they, they typically are kind of a jack of all trades. They can do music of a ton of different genres, and that's why they're there. Is because they're they can they can pump out this stuff really quickly and at a very high standard. Uh, but for their out of house guys, um, they typically go to them for like very niche things and for, for things that um, those people are known for being good at. So like when I pitch myself to production companies, it's it's typically like, I I try to be a jack of all trades of some sort of as a composer. But then when I pitch myself to production companies, I try to find those niches that I think I could shine in on and be able to actually like be of assistance to. So um, having like a, a giant skill set and having and being able to write in different genres and all of that, is it, it can be such a great thing because then you can choose which like which aspect to shine through at different times when you're trying to pitch yourself um so yes and that, that that's really true when it comes to production companies and writing for uh, that type of stuff awesome that's awesome thanks for sharing that um Let's go there. There are a few more questions. We're not going to have uh, enough time to go through all of them, but we'll try to get to two or three more. We're reaching the end of our gathering. Um, two people asked, I think it's, this is more technical. Um, is there uh, uh, Valerie and Ruben 
what are some catalog sites you would recommend submitting to or library sites? Uh, Mitchell, maybe you, you mentioned you, you, you do um, work with libraries. Yeah. Um, so when it, when it comes to submitting and like deciding who to submit to, is it, you can't just say like submit to this place, this place, and this place, because you have, you have the giant catalogs that, taken a ton of music their catalog is tens of thousands of tracks and i mean you can throw your music in there and hope that it gets placed but it's not you're you're in a, a giant lake or a giant ocean of music um when you're looking at catalogs you should be looking at and same thing with production companies you should be looking at like production companies that you think that your music will fit in well with or be able to add to their value quite a bit so um especially like with small boutique production companies or catalogs with not that much music but they have a good client base and you can go to their website see the type of ads see the type of uh, tv spots they get and then be able to customize the, mu the music that you submit to them to show that I can both either bolster what they are doing already or be able to add to that and provide opportunity to be able to um, submit for other opportunities as well. So it's really hard to say just to submit your music to this catalog, this catalog, this catalog. It all depends on what you write. And because every catalog kind of is kind of just tailored for a different type of music or different different niche in the ad world in some sense perfect thanks man um another question uh i guess uh for all you guys do you it, it the question is about mastering but like do you guys mix and master your own compositions when you're working for uh film i guess it's different the music that goes to picture is different than the music that goes on Spotify, but how do you guys usually work? Do you guys mix and master your own tracks? It depends on the production, I would say. Um, first of all, there's a question of money. Is there even budget to have someone mix uh -huh. and master the music? And then there's the other question, um, at least half of my productions, if not more, have to be delivered in surround sound. And that's not something I can do. Um, I could try but um you know it's probably safer to have someone do that who has a dolby certified room that is calibrated properly and who can you know deliver something to the dub stage that is you know properly done and especially if we have you know live recording that needs to be mixed with samples things can get a bit complicated i think the more money there is involved and the more elements there are to it the safer it's probably going to be to get someone who does this on a daily basis for smaller productions I have mixed myself as well if I only had to deliver in stereo and it was you know a low budget production you know then yeah why not uh yeah I mean I personally uh actually enjoy mixing and mastering is a passion of mine uh, uh but again just as Anne said I mean it's it's I don't have a surround set up either. So when the project requires a surround delivery, 5.1 or anything, or again, if there's an orchestra recording that's already been done in 5.1, that you know, it just uh, we need a mixer, you know, to do that. Uh, but I have worked on TV shows uh, that it's eventually 5.1, but they were okay with getting stereo music delivery, and because uh, most of the time, if the TV show is in the box. Uh, music where you know we don't have any real instruments uh i ended up sending lots of just my mixes and then it ended up on the tv shows and it's because also the turnaround is so fast uh that it's also common to that it's and there's almost like no time for a mixer to like do its own pass because they need the delivery back tomorrow <laughs> Mitchell, do you, uh, and Toby? Yeah, um, for my stuff, the vast majority, like for, for the stuff that I do, there's never been an instance where they don't need anything but stereo mixes. So uh, most of the stuff that 
Um, I write, I also mix and master myself unless it has a large budget. Uh, there's been a couple trailer gigs that have been brought on that have been uh, mastered uh, by someone else. Um, and then every once in a while, there'll be a catalog uh, project that they'll source music from different composers. And then at the in the end, they'll have someone mix or master it uh, to kind of have a consistency between all the tracks. Uh, that's typically the only time when they would put together a budget for someone to mix or master uh, music, like catalog music for ads or TV, so. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess my background was in electronic music. Um, I think part of being in that world is, a big part of it is kind of mixing and possibly mastering yourself. Um, it was kind of, I suppose, when SoundCloud was coming up and um, just production from producers in the electronic world particularly just kind of became so competitive. There's so much kind of wizardry going on. Um, you kind of had to to be pretty good, really, on in the kind of technical side of mixing. Um, so I kind of came from that uh background and so as a result feel quite confident with mixing um and often would do it myself and when anything comes to being mastered i always feel a bit nervous because it depends on the engineer you know they can really change your mix a lot um and it's one of those weird sort of dark arts that i don't really understand and i don't i've heard people talk about it. I've, I've been to um, talks from, you know, some of the uh, guys at Abbey Road and, uh, you know, been in the game for like 25 years and the way they describe it's just so, so bizarre. Um, you know, this one guy I remember talking about uh, how he knows when the mastering job's done and he, he, he describes uh, a kind of wind, like coming over his face, like uh, a kind of air from, from his sound system that was, and, and when he gets that certain kind of air, uh, he, he knows the mix is right. And I mean, yeah, just incredible work. It's something that I don't really try to do myself that much, you know, but mixing, um, I'm a bit more comfortable with. Nice, awesome. And I think a last one, um, Maria, she asked for those who have worked as assistants, uh, was there an, an, any like unexpected thing that you've learned? Or I would add, not just people who worked as assistants, but like in your career in general, and uh, Mitchell, Greco, Emir, and Toby, was there any particular situation, you know, like a weird situation or very strange situation or a very weird project that you guys thought like what's going on here uh anything that comes to your mind define weird <laughs> you know i i think on a previous panel you mentioned like a, a session that you did that you were kind of like maybe out of was it out of tune or something or a different like tuning or the, the sheet was wrong no, no, I, I was definitely out of my, out of my depth. Um, I was, uh, I got called to do this session for a movie called RV. And uh, I had worked on demos with a composer by the name of Blake Neely. And the demos ended up, I think he was, I don't know what the, what the deal was. I don't know if he was supposed to write the score with James Newton Howard or if it was, he was demoing stuff. Anyway, it happened that, James heard, oh, who's playing guitar? And so I got called to be second guitar player. And, you know, and I, I asked for the, at that time I asked for the, for the charts ahead of time because, you know, my reading is okay, but we were gonna, you know, be doing some real, real stuff and I wanted to be prepared. And, uh, you know, and I was playing, I was adding a note to a chord and at some point, I think James was like on the talk back saying, hey, and it was myself and George Deering who was a master guitar player. And, and he was like, somebody's playing a C sharp that's not supposed to be there on bar, whatever. And, you know, it was me. And I 
I didn't come forth <laughs> and say, oh, sorry. I just stayed quiet and I didn't play the C sharp next pass. And, you know, and I was sweating bullets on the, that whole session, but it was, it was a great, great experience. Yeah, as an assistant, I'm I'm trying to remember. I mean, there's so many weird things, but obviously we sign NDAs with all the studios, so I can't really <laughs> talk about any of that. Um, I'd say every day is weird because no day, especially as an assistant, when you're starting out and you don't have a routine yet, you just, I mean, every day you're out of your depth and you're f anxious and you're just, you know, every day is different. There's just no... Um, you know, it's, it's very hard to define weird because especially Los Angeles is weird. This whole city is just, I don't know what's going on, uh, specifically Hollywood, that part of town. It's just people are so weird. And then um, you're dealing with um, people you never thought you would meet. That is weird in general. Um, and then um, you know, you're constantly doing stuff that you never thought you would be doing. And you, you see things, you hear things that, um, you know, it's just the, the entire job is very unique, I would say. I, I don't think there was ever a boring day as an assistant. Um, every day something random would happen and I would just shake my head and go, okay, I wasn't prepared for that, but I'm just going to deal with it right now, I guess. Um, I suppose one of the things that are the weirdest thing are the politics, um, especially on bigger studio productions. That's to me, that's the weirdest thing. Just not even the creative work, just the politicians and diplomats in the room trying to figure things out and how decisions are being made. It's crazy. And um, to me, also one of the weird things or more painful things was um, sampling. Um, it's one of the, I think one of the least rewarding jobs I've ever had, like sampling sessions, um, editing samples, tuning samples, looping samples, making sample libraries. It's, it's not what I thought it was until I had to make a string library myself. And it was, um, very grueling. <laughs> it's like some kind of elaborate form of torture, I think. And, um, yeah, that's, uh, this entire job is weird from start to finish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really funny because my, like this, my experience with uh, being a composer assistant currently um, is much different uh, from what you're saying right now because with the, uh, right now I'm composer assistant Steve Picaro and it's not like he has some massive studio with the, with the a ton of people working for him. I'm his only assistant, and uh, that that's a that's about it. Um, and so, but it, it, it's really funny because like I'm on I'm basically an on call assistant. There's no set schedule. Just call call in, call out. Um, and but every day, like you said, is something completely different. Um, and but you, you learn a lot from it. Uh, you gain a lot from it. Um, and yeah, like you, you, you do things that you wouldn't really think that you'd be doing as a as, as an assistant, both in a good way. Um, but yeah, um, one day you'll be doing charts, another day you'll uh, be moving stuff from point A to point B. You, you never know when you go in. Um, but that's my experience. It was working as a sole uh, assistant to a composer right now. I haven't had, I haven't been working in any major uh, studios with a ton of people coming in or out or anything like that. Um, yeah, I guess I was just thinking about this place uh, where we've got our Spitfire HQ based in, in uh, a place called Tile Yard, which is a complex of music studios um, and lots of writers for TV, film, a lot of kind of pop music writers there as well. And I remember kind of um, when I, in the early days, I was kind of doing a whip round trying to meet people. In fact, we were inviting them to a synth night. 
and you know some studios are just absolutely disgusting if people live in there and they've got jobs that are going on for three four days you know they've got pizza boxes they've got coffee cups and they've been sleeping in there and i won't say who it was but i knocked on this particular door and went in and obviously this poor composer i mean he, it was just like this cesspit he was obviously working on a job you know late night been doing the rounds for you know what looked like 72 hours or something and he had just passed wind unfortunately and i open up the door <laughs> and i'm like hey wow and he was like hi uh and i was just sort of gave him the invite very very quickly saying you've got to come to this thing tomorrow yep 7 p.m is that okay and he was just like yep yep no problem and we both knew exactly what was going on <laughs> um it was just terrible and i had to just shoot out of there as quick as i could but yeah studios not always as polished as they look in the, the website photos true <laughs> in here oh in terms of weirdness right i mean i'm it's i think generally you know this job this whole composing thing is you know scheduling flexibility you know this is not a nine to five job you know this is um hours are can be very interesting it can be seven days 24 hours um so and, you know my weird experiences i mean i guess always like were just stress related where you know i was physically getting ill just because of the amount of pressure you know especially in the beginning um and it's just being able to you know uh i mean ultimately this is what we all love this is why we're doing it so it's uh sometimes when i still think about it like you know no matter what it is it's still like you know we're just uh making music and this is and this is what we love so you know we're um it's it's part of it and it's it's like a muscle that you build <laughs> and you love it eventually awesome thank you guys uh really quick last couple of questions really really quick um do you guys know any companies that that work or need audio for vr virtual reality have you guys been in touch with that technology music wise have you composed for vr no no uh a little bit but um there's it's not different from um just writing for video games or something cool. i have a friend who's you know built uh, a developed uh is still i think developing a, a vr big like a big game uh but it's as Anne said it's like pretty similar to any kind of video game i guess world or Awesome. I guess that's it. Well, we, we've reached already a couple of hours, so I'm going to let you guys go. Uh, before, really quick, let me just share this. Uh, just so you guys know, these are, you know, reach out to these people. They're online. They're on Instagram or Facebook. Anne is there. She has a channel where she shares a bunch of cool stuff and content. Toby's here. Uh, Emir Mitchell doesn't use Instagram. He's only on Facebook. Find him. They all have their websites. Check out their work. Greco's there. Bruno is there too. Be My Ears and Music Cosmos. Um, I usually leave. Well, thank you guys. I, I, I don't know if you can see me uh, because of because I'm sharing the screen, but thank you again. Thank you so much. And Toby and Mir and Mitchell for being here today. Really, really appreciate this. Uh, really special gathering. I'm really happy with it. Um, and I, we always leave with, uh, before the pandemic, we were doing these gatherings, like, you know, in, in a room full of people, and we would always have singer songwriters to come and share their music and we would film it and record it. Uh, and we're now ending our sessions with, uh, one of these performances. So feel free to, you know, just like go do your thing now and, or stay and watch um, a performance by Caro Pierotto. Uh, she performed in LA last year or a couple of years ago now. Uh, so thank you again. Thank you guys. An, Toby, Emir, and Michel.